Aerodynamics is one of those things where the more you know about it, the more you know you don't know. Every aerodynamicist I've worked with speaks with a lack of certainty. The longer they've been doing it, the more uncertain their answers are to any questions. Confidence in aerodynamics is often a bad sign. This is because aerodynamics is complicated in a way that few things are. You can add a wing to the back of a car that generates 100 pounds of downforce, but the force on the wing itself might be less than that. In fact, it might be negative. It just changes the flow around the rest of the car. Sometimes you'll see people remove fog lights and add ram air induction, hoping to get high pressure air into the engine, only to find less horsepower than they started with. Rules of thumb can be helpful in automotive design, but take the aerodynamic ones with a grain of salt. This is one of those areas where you can't just wing it. Get it? Wing it? Fortunately, this is a relatively simple and predictable design, so I'll talk about what's happening around the car, I'll use AirShaper to do some computer analyses, and I'll speak with an air of confidence that should make you skeptical of everything I'm saying. Of course, this is YouTube, so you should probably do that anyway. Aerodynamic development on race cars is an attempt to do two things, increase downforce and decrease drag. Unfortunately, these two things directly work against each other. More downforce means more drag, less drag means less downforce. So, you make a trade-off, and that trade-off depends on the course that you're racing on. The slower the corners, the more downforce you want. This year's Pikes Peak winning car, driven by Robin Shute, has so much downforce that its coefficient of drag is literally worse than a brick wall. Talladega has corners, kind of, but they're very long. So long, in fact, that they're basically not corners. You might as well be going in a straight line. Fun story, I worked for a NASCAR team briefly back during the Car of Tomorrow days. They had front splitters that created some downforce, but also a lot of drag. On the fast tracks like Talladega, we didn't need downforce, so we tried to minimize the drag. The first year those cars were out, there were only a couple of rules on the front splitter. It had to be a certain shape, and it had to have five supports in specific spots. We found out through wind tunnel testing that this part of the car was basically a parachute, slowing us down. We also found out that the supports were really good at keeping air out of the parachute. The bigger they were, the faster the car would go. We couldn't make it look like we were doing it on purpose or else the inspectors would tell us to take a hike, so we just bought hardware that was too big, too long, and made it look like we didn't know what we were doing. That's the real challenge in NASCAR, to spend half a million dollars on testing and developing a component that looks like it was cobbled together by a hillbilly in a shed. People say that technology trickles down from racing into road cars, but that's actually pretty rare. Even in the top levels of racing, you're usually just dancing around some arbitrary rules that have no relevance outside of one racing series, or sometimes even just one track. But, I digress. The fewer corners you have, the less drag you want. And there is no place with fewer corners than the Bonneville Salt Flats. Okay, so drag racing is also pretty in a straight line, and they do have cars with big wings. They need to accelerate very quickly, which means they need to be as lightweight as possible, but lower weight means less traction, so they add wings to get the tires to stick to the pavement, allowing them to continue their crazy acceleration in a very short distance. In land speed racing at the Bonneville Salt Flats, you have several miles to get up to speed, so you don't really need that downforce. Or rather, you do, but it's more advantageous to strap a lead to your car. The car will accelerate slower, which is fine because you have 7 miles to get up to speed, but without the wings you're not creating any extra drag so your top speed can be faster. Out here, it's all about top speed. There are some land speed cars that use wings, especially at the shorter courses like the Texas Mile and El Mirage. If you have a shorter course and lots of horsepower, the race becomes more like a drag race, so those wings come in handy. It's less of a concern at the long courses like Bonneville or the Salt Flats in Bolivia, and almost none of the really fast cars have wings generating any downforce. So, with a car like this one, relatively low power and low drag, we're not going to use any wings, so we're not going to talk about them, partly because I'm not using them, and partly because that would be a whole video on its own. Today, we're talking about the aerodynamics of minimizing drag. Aerodynamic drag can be thought of as your car doing work to the air. Churning butter takes a lot of work because you're mixing up the fluid, causing it all to get swirly and turbulent, I'm guessing, I've never churned butter. But your car is doing the same thing to the air. It's mixing it all up, and all that mixing takes work. It takes horsepower. So to minimize drag, you do as little work as possible. Aerodynamic efficiency is essentially letting your car be as lazy as possible. There are two big ways to do this, size and shape, or what aerodynamicists call frontal area and drag coefficient. Frontal area is the size of the vehicle looking at it from the front. The smaller the better. That's pretty simple, and it's why all these land speed racing cars are 2 feet tall, 2 feet wide, and 30 feet long. Smaller vehicles churn less air, so less drag. 
But a small shape can punch a big hole in the air. Race cars are really good at doing this, throwing air really high and creating a giant wake. 18-wheelers sometimes have boat tails that do the opposite of this. These pull the air back in behind the truck, so while the truck is big, the hole that punches through the air is not much bigger. Wheels are also really bad at churning up the air. As an engineer, I kind of hate this progression towards bigger wheels and smaller sidewalls. Not only does it impart more load into the suspension, but it also creates a lot more drag. You can see this pretty clearly in Tesla's online builder. There is a 30 mile drop in total range when increasing the wheel diameter by three inches. Aerodynamic textbooks like to split drag between frontal area and the drag coefficient of the shape, but I like to remember that shapes have high drag coefficients in part because they create a big wake, effectively increasing the frontal area. That's part of the reason why this has way lower drag than anything else. Of course, cars don't look like these shapes, mostly. Automotive aerodynamics is difficult because there are a lot of complex shapes and a lot of moving parts. Also, external factors lead to poor aerodynamic performance. You can't design an ugly car or nobody will buy it. You can't make a car too small or nobody will fit in it. And you can't have everything stationary because that's not how wheels work. But when you start to cover the wheels, smooth out the front, taper the back, and eliminate variables, things start to get simple, or as simple as they can be with aerodynamics. Airflow around a smooth body like this starts out as laminar flow. It's all nice and smooth and flowing right up against the body. This is the best flow, very low drag. But there's always some friction with the body surface that causes the nice smooth flow to transition into turbulent flow. The friction between the body and the air slows down the air really close to the body, but the air moving an inch or two away from the body is still moving fast, so this causes the air to tumble around. Turbulent flow is worse than laminar flow, so you always want to keep your airflow as clean as possible for as long as possible. Nice smooth surfaces. On a car this long, it will eventually become turbulent. It's not ideal, but it's not the worst. The worst is when that flow becomes separated. This is a 1950 Jaguar that was designed when engineers knew basically nothing about aerodynamics. It has a lot of drag. I know this because it gets about half the range of the Tesla that I got the powertrain out of. You might look at this and think this tall radiator up front is causing all of that drag, or perhaps this wall of a windshield, and neither of these things help, but I'm willing to bet that a lot of the drag comes from the part of the car that looks aerodynamically shaped. This part back here. What's happening here is that the air across the top is relatively smooth attached flow. Same thing with the Tesla here. But once we move back, the Tesla gently pulls that flow down, keeping it mostly happy. Once the air hits the top of the trunk, it is instantly detached. It goes from attached to detached pretty much instantly right here. The Jag doesn't do that. It gently pulls the flow down, but then keeps pulling it down. The air wants to go back, but it can't because the body is trying to pull it further and further down. Eventually, the air starts to panic. It doesn't know what to do. Does it go back? Does it go forward? Does it flail its little arms around, expending all its energy like an invisible toddler having a temper tantrum? Yes, all of those things. Temper tantrum toddler takes tons of torque, power actually, from your motor. It's real bad. You see how it's all rounded back here but has sharp edges up front? This car would almost certainly have less aerodynamic drag in reverse. Backwards, this car has the general shape you want. Round up front, sharp edges out back. If you want the lowest drag, you probably want a teardrop shape. This doesn't really have sharp edges in the back, it just has one sharp point, but you don't really need the sharp point. You can chop off the tail like this and your total drag only goes up by a bit. But if you instead chopped off the front like this, your drag goes way up. But wait, there's more. Let's say you create an extremely aerodynamic shape and you put it in the wind tunnel and it's awesome. And then you put it on the track and it's not quite so awesome. We live in a world with wind. If you're going this way and the wind is blowing this way, as far as your car is concerned, you're actually going this way. And at some point, your nice attached flow becomes separated and all hell breaks loose. So while it may be perfectly fine to have a 10 degree tail in a straight line condition, you might want to extend it a bit for the real world. Also worth noting, a lot of cars use fins at the back to stabilize the car at speed. These are like the fins on the back of a dart. It's important that these fins have some actual thickness and an airfoil-shaped leading edge. A lot of people just use flat plates, and these things do help straighten out the car, but they do it by creating a lot of drag. An airfoil shape will give the car a correcting moment with a lot less drag. Okay, so we have the basics down. Nice airfoil shape, gradual transitions, smooth body. Now it's time to prove it with simulations. This is not really proving it. Any decent engineer will tell you that you have to correlate your simulations with real world testing, but we haven't gotten that far yet, and this will help us get there. Computational fluid dynamics, or CFD, has come a long way in the past few years. 
Computers have gotten more powerful and can crunch more numbers, making the highly complex world of aerodynamics a little more knowable. Still, the software is expensive, the computing power is significant, and most of the people I know who run this software have advanced degrees. Fortunately, there are alternatives for the likes of you and me. I've been using AirShaper. It's nice because the setup is simple, you don't need $30,000 in software, and they do all the intense computation on their side. Full disclosure, they let me run these analyses at no cost, but I do like it. It gives results in line with my experience, it helped to weigh certain decisions, and it gave me some great ideas for design directions. Setup is simple, you upload your CAD model, orient it into the airflow, tell it if you're on the ground or in the air, hopefully on the ground in a car. You can also load different bodies in for the wheels and have actual rotating wheels. This is super important because rotating wheels affect the air so much. If you leave them out, you can compute results faster, but they're not going to be accurate. The system crunches the numbers for a bit and then emails you when it's done. I talked about this a bit in a previous video, but the big initial testing I did with AirShaper was to decide on wheel size. I can use solid aluminum wheels up front, but it's easier to use the rubber Goodyear tires for a few reasons. A back-to-back -back analysis showed the larger wheels to not be a significant drawback. I also ran some optimizations around the vehicle. The nose in particular was interesting. The analysis shows an advantage with a more pointed nose. Also, the direction of the nose was optimized. You do actually want some airflow going underneath the car. A lot of people will stick the car as close to the ground as possible, but this just results in the airflow under the car getting really messy. I also tried a jagged tail. This is basically a bunch of vortex generators. This forces the flow to detach. I stole this idea from Honda. It has a small advantage in reducing drag, but it's also free, so I'll do it. An interesting thing from these analyses is the portion of the drag that comes from skin friction. It's a lot. Typically on a car or motorcycle, it would be a pretty small percentage of the total drag, but since this car is so small and so smooth, it becomes a big contributor. This means I'll have to be really careful about getting a smooth body made and about minimizing holes and transitions. One thing I see a lot on these cars that I'm not super sure about is ram air intakes. The idea is that you get 200 mile per hour air rammed into your intake, giving you more power, but you also lose out on speed because of the additional aerodynamic drag. Some cars have added these intakes and others have removed them over time. The advantage changes based on whether or not you have a turbo, how fast you're going, and how much air you're pumping. My guess is that it's probably more often not an advantage, but that might just depend on how well it's designed. I'm going to pull my air from the front of the car. This is the highest pressure air, and so it should give a horsepower advantage and a decrease in drag, in theory. This is definitely one of those things that needs testing. One of the land speed racers with the most records told me it wouldn't work and it was a waste of time, but two separate aerodynamicists told me it would probably help and that it's worth trying, so I'm going to try it. The cool thing about this is that I can have an air box in the back that has a valve on the side. I get up to top speed and then I open the valve. If it goes faster after the valve is open, then it's not an advantage. I can actually have two valves, one that stops the flow from the front and pulls air from inside the car. The other would allow the air to flow in the engine bay, but not necessarily directed to the engine intake. Based on the speed, I can see what is best, and based on engine data, I can find what the effect on horsepower is. The National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics was a federal agency established in 1915 to undertake aeronautical research. It was folded into NASA in the late 1950s, but not before publishing lots of research on aerodynamic devices. Some of their most lasting research was on airfoils and ducts. You've probably heard of NACA ducts. This is where they came from. People talk about these with a reverence, like they're from some infallible source, but they were designed 80 years ago, well before computer analysis and quality testing. The theory is simple. You gradually expand an opening on a smooth surface. These two profiles create counter-rotating vortices, and high-speed air gets rammed into a heat exchanger or engine intake or whatever. Here's the deal. Many times when I've heard of people actually testing these things, they don't work. That's not to say they don't fundamentally work. I'm sure Boeing and Ferrari did their testing to confirm functionality. Dodge, probably not. But a lot of people throw these things on and find out they have less airflow. The air around the car flows in complex ways, so sometimes you only get one vortex or turbulent flow pulls the air out. You see these all over the place in auto racing, and it's one of those things you have to test. You can check your air pressure in the duct, although if the duct geometry is different, you could get a lower pressure for higher flow. A fuel-injected engine should be able to tell you pretty easily if you're getting more power, although that won't tell you if the extra drag created by the duct is worth the extra power. You could tape it up and drive really fast, and then remove the tape and drive really fast again and see which way is faster. But this is all assuming the environmental variables are all the same, like temperature, air pressure, and wind, and they're probably not. This is the sort of thing that might be best done with a computer analysis. You can draw a duct in your bodywork and see how it affects total drag and how much of the airflow you get through it. 
You can also run an optimization if you're really looking for efficiency. That will warp the geometry to find the optimum shape. It's probably not the exact shape that was originally drawn in 1945. Every time someone starts talking about reducing aerodynamic drag, somebody else has to suggest adding golf ball dimples. Golf balls are dimpled to reduce drag and allow them to travel farther, so adding dimples to a car should also reduce its drag, no? No. Well, kind of. Remember before when I was talking about that laminar flow turning into turbulent flow after a while? Well, it actually happens pretty quickly. But a golf ball is so small that it just stays laminar until it detaches, usually pretty early, creating a big wake of chaos. If you can force that flow to become turbulent, it sticks to the golf ball a little bit longer and you get less chaos. Something like a basketball would be big enough that the flow would become turbulent on its own even if it was smooth, so adding dimples to a basketball wouldn't help. On the scale of golf ball to basketball, a car is here. A car is also neither spherical nor rotating unless you really messed up. Now, I know a lot of you nerds out there are yelling about Mythbusters and the time they increased a car's gas mileage by adding dimples to it, so if their experiment worked, how can I say that it doesn't work? Well, two reasons. One is that Mythbusters is not a scientific study, they're not controlling all the variables, they're not doing multiple tests, and the times that other people have repeated this test, they've gotten different results. But I also think it's important to note that it might actually work for this car. If the car is a bad shape to start with, dimples could affect the point of separation or change the way the pillars and the rear deck create vortices. It's hard to say because, like I said before, aerodynamics is super complicated. Dimples might improve a bad car, but it's doing so by a different mechanism than we see on golf balls. On a car, it might just be fixing bad airflow. But if you start with a good shape, you're not going to get any advantage from adding dimples. I might be able to increase the range of my Jag by adding dimples back here, though it would be better with actual vortex generators. A Tesla is probably not going to see any advantage from dimples. You don't need to rely on tricks if you get the shape right to begin with. So, start with a good design. If you want to reduce drag, you need a shape that is long and slender, with smooth transitions, and a rounded, pointed nose slightly lowered. Of course, you need a little bump for the front wheels, and possibly some vortex generators on the back to cause the air to become fully turbulent. And that is how you make a low drag vehicle. Thanks for watching. It used to be that you had to impress people to get people to watch your show. Now you just have to impress the algorithm. So do me a favor, hit that subscribe button. All hail the algorithm. to the side. <laughs>